in dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a critic of the thoughts and tents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, for he furnished unto all good work. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A word that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly right. dividing the word of truth. And what do we say? The there spiritual spin stops right. right here. Because we really care for you. Go ahead and uh, pray for us, Steve. Give us about 15 seconds or so to prepare. Father, we come to you with thankful hearts for the privilege of taking time from our start a week off the study of your word. We ask your blessing on everything that's taught here yeah. tonight. We thank you for Dr. Jim's ministry. We thank you for the great turnout last Sunday for the yeah. special event we had. It was a blessing. And we just pray for many continued uh, good sermons, good messages, good Bible teaching in the times ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yes, and it really was, folks. It was a great day uh, yesterday at the uh, U.S. Pizza with that uh, hour Bible teaching. And then an hour, about, about two hours of fellowship. So, anyway, we're going to move on from here. Today's subject is Acts 22, verses 19 through 30. We should finish chapter 22, 22 tonight. And then on um, Wednesday, Steve, you and I'll go back, if you're able to be here, we'll go back to Romans. And then on Sunday morning, we'll come back to Acts chapter 23. So, let's move on from there. And uh, what I wanted to do is. Because we're right, I mean, we're right in the middle of a, an important section where Paul is, at, is in Rome, uh, I mean, sorry, in, in Jerusalem, and he has been maligned again by a mob, and we find him giving a report uh, on his three missionary journeys and telling these people about all that he has done in his three missionary journeys. And the mob comes and begins to complain, become violent, and uh, this was right in the midst of, of Paul's giving a defense about what he's doing. So what we're going to do is summarize, we're in chapter 22, but what we're going to do is summarize verses 1 through 18. And in verse 1 through 18, actually what he's doing is summarizing what took place with him on the road to Damascus in uh, in Acts chapter 9. So we're going to summarize Acts chapter 9. Uh, Saul of Tarsus departed Jerusalem. And I say Saul of Tarsus because at this point in time he is still an unbeliever. He is a an unbelieving religious Jew, legalistic type. And uh, he's on his way from Jerusalem to uh, to Damascus to persecute Messianic Jews in that area. And on his way, second bullet point, on his way to Damascus, he was struck down by a bright light. And that bright light was actually Christ. He said on, the same, on that same road, on that occasion, Saul actually became a believer in Jesus Christ as a Messianic Jew. So he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And the next bullet point, Saul is now a believer, but I made made it uh, very clear yesterday that uh, for those who are, you know, Acts 2 kind of believers, they would say he became a Christian at this point in time. But I don't hold that opinion. Uh, Paul actually be, was converted to become a born-again believer, but he was a Messianic Jew at that point in time. And Saul was partially blinded as a result of that light, and he was being led into Damascus where a man by the name of Ananias was going to meet him. And Ananias, when he met him, had a message from Jesus Christ, and that message was from Saul. And uh, sometimes in my notes in this area, I'll write Saul slash Paul, because this is Paul, but it was him before he became, uh, before, before he became a believer. So Ananias' message to, to Paul from Christ was that Jesus Christ was going to send Paul, he's going to send him forward as an apostle to the Gentiles. That word's going to be important to us here just in a little while. So Saul went into the Arabian Desert. After he was saved, immediately he went into the Arabian Desert. He's out there for three years learning from Jesus Christ himself. And what he's doing is he's learning the mystery dogmas of the church age. He already knows the Old Testament. He's a scholar in the Old Testament. 
but he's learning the mystery, uh, the mystery doctrines of the church age that heretofore were not presented anywhere in the, in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, and in the first part of the book of Acts, not there. So we see then he goes into the Arabian desert to learn this. He's out there for three years. Many, some, some don't agree with that, but I believe that he was out there for three years. And we've taken the Acts 9 chapter and, and a passage in, in Galatians chapter 1 and uh, seem to indicate to us that uh, this was clear, that we've inductively concluded that uh, Paul was out there three years and he was saved while he was there, that he, he became a born-again Christian while he was there. So Saul's in the Arabian desert, became a, that's where he became a born-again Christian. Now, I'm going to call him Paul from on up, from after he becomes a born-again Christian, I'm going to call him Paul. Before that, we may, be, we may find him talking as a born-again Christian, but he's referring to something back in his past. And in that case, I might say this is Paul, but this was when he was actually known as Saul of Tarsus. So now what happened then, after he was in the Arabian Desert for three years and became a born-again Christian, learning the mystery doctrines of the church age, he goes back then to Damascus and then leaves and goes to Jerusalem. Paul went back to Jerusalem and was persecuted for his newfound belief. Now, in point number two, we fast forward from chapter nine, giving, giving that scenario and giving detail about his, uh, his conversions. In Acts 13, Paul, Barnabas, and, and Mark actually left Jerusalem together and Paul began his, the first of his three missionary journeys. Then in, in chapter 21, fast forwarding to chapter 21, Paul is now back in Jerusalem, and I believe it's for the fifth time, and has now been arrested. Now remember we'd indicated that when Paul was, when Paul was getting ready to go to, to, um, uh, to, to Jerusalem on this occasion, he was warned, he was warned by some disciples, don't put a foot in Jerusalem. And, and Steve and, and folks that are in this room, this is extremely important to us. I don't know. I don't know what I know for a fact. That 10, 15, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have understood this. I wouldn't have known. known, known. Matter of fact, I might not have even known that, you know, when you tell him, don't step a foot in, in Jerusalem. My, my early mentor and mentors indicated to me that Paul was making a mistake. Paul was guilty, he was guilty of failing to, to be obedient to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit told these guys, but see, that's the, that's the, I think that's the kicker in this. The Holy Spirit told some disciples, tell Paul, don't go. The Holy Spirit didn't tell Paul, don't go. The Holy Spirit told the disciples, tell him, don't go. Well, if they're going to be obedient, if the Holy, if the Holy Spirit tells these disciples, tell Paul, don't put a foot in Jerusalem, what are they supposed to do? Obey the Holy Spirit. Obey, see, that's it, Steve. They are to obey the Holy Spirit. So they did exactly what the Holy Spirit told them to do. But Paul, at the same time, was being told by the Holy Spirit, go into Jerusalem. So we have to reconcile that. How in, the whole, how in the world can the Holy Spirit tell two different people two different things and still be right? Well, we, we came to the answer. We know what the answer is. What was the Holy Spirit doing to Paul when he told the disciples, tell them, don't go? He was, te they were, he was testing him. God was testing Paul. Are you going to listen to me? So while the disciples listened to him, Paul also had to listen to him. Paul did what the Holy Spirit told him to do. The disciples told him what to do. And it's only human beings like us that don't understand that. <laughs> Until we realize that it was a test. So Paul goes on into Jerusalem then. And we find that's, that's what happened in, in Acts 21. But when we get to 22, Paul is now in court defending himself before religious Jewish leaders. In verse 15... Ananias tells Paul that he will be a special, uh, special witness. Now, in verse 15, he's reflecting back now into chapter 9. So Ananias tells Saul, Paul, that he will be a special witness for Jesus Christ. In verse 16, Paul testifies regarding the details of his conversion. Back in chapter 9. Then in verse 17, Paul falls into a trance. And yesterday we indicated 
we were talking about um, the fact that uh, this was not this was omitted in chapter nine. Luke didn't talk about this trance in chapter nine. Okay, he's in the temple, but he doesn't say anything about a trance. We also talked about Paul after he left the Arabian desert was receiving occasionally he would receive further revelation from Jesus Christ. And that's what he told him. He said, you, he said, you're going out and you're going to teach, you're going to preach what you have seen and heard. And we said that that word seen is the word horao in the Greek, and it means that you're going to come to a time when you have this panoramic view of all that the, the age of grace is going to be about. So Paul falls into this trance, and then in that trance, Christ warns Paul, <laughs> Here it is. Get out of town. Get out of town again. So Jesus warns him to get out of town. Now we also indicated coming up in future in future chapters, we realize that Jesus uh, that Paul has been told that you will be a witness to rulers and kings. And up to this point in time, Paul has not Paul has not had the opportunity to witness to rulers and kings and had we're going to find out and discover that had he not gone to Jerusalem, he would not have completed, he would not have finished the race, okay? He, he, Paul talks about being in a race, and he's headed for the finish line. Well, if Paul had rejected the Holy Spirit and listened to those seven those disciples, he would have not gone to Jerusalem, and he would have missed the opportunity then to go to Rome, where he's going to be able to witness to rulers and kings. So he was obedient. Okay, now with that in mind then, Paul, uh, Christ warns him to get out of town. Now, Paul, here's what happens. Jesus has spoken to Paul. Get out of town. But Paul's going to say, no, nope. Paul's going to rationalize with Jesus. And here's what he says in verse 19. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those, those, uh, those who believed in you. Now, let's look at that. Paul is speaking here. Remember, Jesus has just told him, do what? Get out of town. Get out of town. So Paul said, wait a minute, just a second. No, I know, Lord, you don't understand. I don't, I don't need to get out of town. I need to witness to these people. And if I'm in town, I'm not going to be able to do that. These people need you just like I needed you back there. And he says, look, let me, let me explain something, Jesus. You know, I, I, you understand, and they understand, that when I went from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, he said that I used to imprison. He's going looking for Messianic Jews. And he said, I would go into those places, and I would imprison and beat those. Who's he beating? Messianic Jews. Those, who, those Jews who actually believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He said, I imprisoned and beat those. Who believe in you? Who believed in you? Well, here's what happens. Jesus tells Paul to get out of town. And what does Paul do? Paul rationalizes by telling Jesus. Now, listen. I, I think this is humor. To me, it's humorous. Paul is telling Jesus something as though Jesus needs to be informed. You know, like you you, you don't understand, Lord. I, I here's what, remember this is what I did. Okay. These people, and Paul's rationalizing, he said, these people, that is the unbelieving religious Jews, they know me. They know me. How do they know him? It was they who sent him to Damascus. It is they who knew him prior to this time. So these people, that is these religious leaders, say the unbelieving religious leaders, they know me. That's what Paul's telling Jesus. So he said, one synagogue after another, what did I do? He said, I imprisoned Messianic Jews. I beat Messianic Jews. These people know who I am. So question, if Jesus tells you to get out of town, should you argue with him? Or should you get out of town? Yeah, get out of town. But it's amazing. I Listen, I know, I know for a fact that it, the, the old man, the flesh, you get so tied up in yourself about who you are, and you say, "Now you look, you know, you just don't, Steve. You don't understand, man. If you just give me a chance to get in here now, uh, we'll just whip them into shape here, and they'll be, they'll be just like we are here." In, in the, no, no, no. You don't argue with Jesus. You just do what He tells you. So Paul continues to rationalize with Jesus. If if one if one verse wasn't enough, he's 
you're going to have to go on another one. So in verse 20, in verse 20 he says, and when, the, and when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, he said, I was also standing by approving and watching out for, uh, watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. So let's look at that. When the blood of your, your witness, it, your, your witness, who was your witness? Your witness was Stephen. Stephen became a martyr. And while that was happening, while Stephen was being martyred, guess what? Saul's standing by. He's consenting to Stephen's death. And guess, no, don't lose, don't lose sight here. He's talking to Jesus about this. Do you think when, when, when Paul told that, Jesus looked at him and says, Wow, Paul, I didn't realize that. No, Jesus already knew this. He said, there was a stand there. I was holding their clothes while they were killing Stephen. Well, Paul continues to rationalize with Jesus is what it amounts to. He said, look, Lord, I've been on both sides of the fence. He says, look, you, you understand, I killed believing Jews in the past. Now, guess what? I want unbelieving Jews to be saved. See, there's his motive. He wants to stay there. Lord, I want to stay in Jerusalem. He said, they'll listen to me. And I say, oh, yeah. Uh -huh, yeah, they're going to listen to you. It ain't going to be long before they're, you better get out of town, Paul. So Jesus will send Paul to the Gentiles. In verse 21, it says, <clears throat> and he, Jesus Christ, said to me, Paul, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now, notice that phrase, to the Gentiles. We have a mob now that has been, been rioting against Paul. And the Roman military, find, they, they are aware now that this is going on. So they show up. But what is happening here, Jesus tells Paul, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. This mob... When Paul gets to speaking to them, that mob is going to quiet down, okay? They're going to quiet down. And we call this, we, they were a mob, but they actually become an audience now. They, you see, they're, they're not listening when they're, they're writing and, and, and violently opposing Paul. But they quiet down. And when they do, that mob then becomes an audience, and they are willing to listen. But Jesus tells them, I'm going to send you far away to the Gentiles. So this mob audience was listening until the word Gentiles came up. And now what happened in verse 22, the mob is going to, the, uh, the audience is going to become a mob again, okay? Verse 22. Paul's audience returns to, be a, to being a mob. In verse 22, it says, they listened to him up to this statement. And then they raised their voice and said, away with such a fellow, far from the earth, for he shall not be allowed to live. So the mob, the, the audience has now become a mob. Who are they? They, the mob, these are the religious unbelieving Jews in Jerusalem. The word listen there means they kept on listening. This wasn't just, oh, yeah, I, I heard him what he said right then. No, when he started to talk and give the details of what Jesus had done with him on these missionary journeys, they stopped and they listened. And that word listen means they kept on listening to Paul. And they kept on listening up to, what's the phrase? They kept on listening to him up to what? Up to this statement. What statement? In verse 21, he was telling them that Jesus told him, go, I will send you far away, what? To the, to the Gentiles. So they were listening to him. The mob calmed down. They were listening to him until he made that statement. That Jesus told me, I'm going to go far away to the Gentiles. Well, these are, these are religious, unbelieving Jews, and Paul's talking to them about Gentiles. He said, wait a minute, see? So they tell him, away with that fella. Get him out of here, far from the earth. He shouldn't even be allowed to live. Well, let's look at the phrases. They listened to him. Up to, the point, up to this point in Paul's speech, Paul avoided the fatal word Gentile. But this one word Gentile immediately inflamed the mob again. 
and brought about a second outburst. The first one was when they, they were rallying against him to begin with. Then he get all calmed down. Then he used the word Gentile, and bang, they, they've become inflamed again. And they brought about a second outburst in the area between the temple and the fort. Now, this, we'd, seen this some, we'd seen this earlier, probably back in chapter 9, back in that area, where this is what happened. We, we saw that the tower was close by there. And they were, the, Romans, the Roman soldiers were able to see what was going on here. Same thing happened here. So this second outburst was in the area between the temple and the fort. Now, the word Gentile ended Paul's message. When he said Gentile, that was it. The message is over, okay? That word so antagonized the mob of religious Jews, unbelieving type, and manifested their maximum negative volition toward the grace of God. Okay? So what happened? This mob of unbelieving religious Jews fought that being, a, listen to this, the, the, this mob of unbelieving religious Jews thought that being a Jew by birth, being circumcised, and keeping the Mosaic Law as a way of salvation was all that was necessary, and the Gentiles were excluded from this system. Okay. It was obvious to them that Paul, a Jew, had the audacity to take salvation of the Gentiles. Stop and think about that just for a minute. You've got this great big mob out there. And they hate, they hate these people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now Paul tells them he is one. I want to explain this mission to me. I want to, I want to explain what, this, what the Messiah has told me. Well, it was obvious that Paul, to them, was a Jew, but he had the audacity to take salvation of the Gentiles, and this so antagonized them that it led to a fresh outburst of rage. What do they do? It says they lifted up their voices and said. What does that mean? Well, what that means is they lifted up their voices. The mob started to scream. They lost control of their reason. Their mental faculties went out the window. And what do they do? They express that vocally. Hi, Cody. Okay. You, just, you know, when you, when you stop and think about that, why don't you take it, why don't you take a look if you haven't already? And I know most of you have. You look at this. You look at the the mob, the mob scenes on TV today. The Antifa and others gathering. College students have gathered in the past. You saw what you saw what happened you saw what happened to the police just recently pouring water on them throwing throwing buckets at them okay the mob started screaming they have lost control of their reason expressed it vocally this mob is made up of individuals and each one was throwing a tantrum at the same time this is certainly a frustrated mob why because because all because they all know that the one thing available to them is to throw a tantrum. That's going to be all that's available to them. They're not going to be able to do any more. We'll see why. But they're not going to be able to do any more to Paul violently. The only thing left to them is just throw a tantrum. So they call they 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 can no longer get to the apostle Paul, and here's the reason why. Remember we said back there a little while ago that this this whole scene took place between the area of the temple and the fort, they can no longer get to the Apostle Paul because he is being protected by Roman law. And here's what they said. Away with this fellow. See, that there's part of their tantrum. Away with this fellow. This means get Paul out of here. Remove him. Why? They go on to say he should not be allowed to live. Just kill him. Well, according to this, Paul, this mob, never again should Paul be allowed to eat or drink or live like a normal person. The mob wants Paul to stop functioning as a human being. Stop right now. What did, what did, uh, what did Jesus tell Paul? Did he tell him, oh, yeah, yeah, you, listen, you're such a wonderful man, and you just, you're, just so, you're so faithful and you're so vibrant and so courageous. You just stay in there and give them the gospel. Is that what he told him? No. No, just, Paul, you better get out of town. You better get out of town, Paul. 
According to this mob, never again should he do anything but just die. Now, in verse 23, we see the mob demonstrating. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust in the air. Tossing dust in the air. Now, what would you... <laughs> What would you do if you were outside and you saw a bunch of kids messing around and tearing their clothes off and throwing dirt in the air? you say, what in the world's going on here? So as they were crying out and throwing, the, throwing off their cloaks, this is all, what I, this one called Operation Tantrum, okay? Paul is now totally under... Now, but while they're throwing this tantrum, you need to realize that Paul is now totally under the protection of Rome. That's why it was so important when we went back there and looked and saw this idea that this, this whole mob scene was taking place close to the area between the temple and, and, the, and the fort. So the mob, right now, the mob is totally ineffectual. So if they, if, they can't, if they can't attack him, what's the only thing they got left to do? Oh, Throw a tantrum. That's it. Just scream at him, okay? So at this point in time, because he's going to be under the protection of Rome, the mob is totally ineffectual. So verse 23 is actually the reaction. And this is, I think this is interesting. This is the reaction of religious and legalistic people. Okay? Now, let me point out something here. Right now, right now we have four women in Congress. They're just throwing one tantrum right after another. Now hold just a, let's not it's not the, it's not their ethnicity, it's not the the color of their skin. Uh, they're, they're throwing tantrums, okay? That's what I want you to see. They're throwing tantrums. That's all they can do. They have no other recourse at this point in time. Just throw a tantrum. So the, and and guess what? One of them, one of them at least is a is a Muslim. So what we're saying, this is the reaction of religious and legalistic people. Point verse 24. The Roman commander now is going to take charge. Verse 24 reads, the commander ordered, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks. Now remember, Paul is out, he's out at, among, among this crowd, okay? Violently seeking to attack him. So the Roman commander says uh, he orders Paul to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging so that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. Stop and get the picture there. This mob is attacking Paul out there, okay? And so the, the, the Roman commander shows up with some military. He said, better get this guy back inside. Get him, get him inside. So he, he had ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks, stating that when he gets him in there, he's going to try to find out what in the world's going on out there. What is wrong with you? What has, what has caused these people to be so violent against you? What's going on? Now, what's going to happen is the commander is going to assume that Paul is somebody other than who he is. So he's going to say, all the... Uh, Listen, when I get him, when we get him inside, he's just going to lie to us. But we have see, we are a people of law and order. So we've got to get to the bottom of this and find out what was causing this outside. Now, because of a false assumption on this commander's part, he's going to think that Paul will lie to him. So here's the issue. If I think you're going to lie to me, I'll just get the whips out. I'll just start beating you until you stop lying and give me the truth. So what happened here is the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by what? He, you're going to examine him by scourging him. Do you, do you, listen, are you understanding what I'm saying? He's, he wants to get to the bottom of what, what's going, what caused this thing out there, and he thinks that Paul is, is the, the source of the problem. Well, he is, but for a different reason. And so if I'm going to get this guy to tell me the truth, guess what? We're going to have to beat it out of him. 
So the Roman commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he, Paul, should be examined by scourging. Why? So that he, the commander, might find the reason why they were shouting against him that way. Do you understand what's going on there? You understand it? So Paul is under the protection of the Romans here. In that sense, how is he under the protection? He, the, the commander's not allowing the people outside to kill him. Because he was a Roman citizen. Okay, well, that's right, because he's a Roman citizen. Yeah. So Paul is under the protection of Rome, Romans here, but he has yet to tell the Roman commander that he himself is actually a Roman citizen. Well, what's the big deal about that? You see, under Roman law, Roman citizens, listen to this, under Roman law, Roman citizens were presumed truthful. And non-Roman citizens were what? Liars. Mm-hmm. Are presumed to be liars. So what happened is when this guy looked at when this guy looked at Paul, he thinks he's a Jew. He's going to lie to us. We don't have any idea what, what's going on. What caused this out here? So let's just—he's not going to lie to us. So let's just beat him till he gives us the truth. Threaten to beat him. Okay. Therefore. Presuming non-Roman citizens to be liars, therefore the Romans first produced. Listen, the the, the Romans first introduced the concept of pain to non-Romans by beating them. Are you follow that? You're a liar. I know you're not going to tell me the truth, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to beat you till you give up and say, "Oh, hold it! I'll tell, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it is." See? So they assume that. They presume that. Paul's going to lie to us. So we'll get the truth and just beat him, okay? Therefore, the Romans first introduced. That doesn't mean they first introduced it 50 years ago. That means to you, we're going to get the truth, and I'm going to introduce you to pain, okay? So they first introduced the concept of pain to non-Roman citizens by beating them. Now, what happens? After the beating, the next step is to ask questions with a threat of more pain on tender, fleshly, fleshly beaten backs. So here's the issue. We're going to beat you. And after we've beaten you, we're going to ask you, what happened? And we think you're still lying. Guess what? We're going to beat you some more until we finally get down to the truth. Now, this treatment may seem harsh to you and me today. It doesn't, it doesn't in the world of Islam. Okay? But outside that, hey, look. This treatment may seem harsh to us today, but for the Romans, it worked well for 800 years leading up to Paul's time period. Okay, worked real well. So in this verse, it says the Roman, uh, the, the, the commander, let's talk about the commander. This is the Roman garrison commander who begins his investigation with, now see, he begins his investigation without pertinent information about Paul. What was he missing here? That he was a Roman citizen. That's right. He's missing the idea. That's a that's a helicopter. So yeah. So here's what here's what happened. This Roman commander is going to function under a false assumption. If he had known that Paul was a was a Roman, he wouldn't he wouldn't have suggested the beating. But he thinks he's a, he thinks he's a Jew. He's going to lie to us. He's he, so he's going to lie to us. Guess what? We'll just beat him until he tells us. So this Roman garrison commander who begins his investigation without pertinent information about Paul then changes to the correct procedure. We'll see that. So he commanded, he commanded Paul to be brought into the barracks. That means that the Roman commander can't investigate in front of a mob. Do you have any idea why? If he's out there in front of the mob and he's trying to get, he's trying to get Paul to talk, and what's ha- every time Paul opened his mouth, he can't hear him because of the screaming going on, okay? Maybe some pushing and shoving along the way. So the Roman commander can't investigate in front of a mob, and he had no intention of, going, uh, of doing so. He's not going to do that. This is a man of law and order. So it's, okay, let's get inside the barracks here. We'll try to find out what's going on there. So the mob is going to be dispersed, and Paul, as the source of their antagonism, is going to be removed 
from their sight. So Paul is out of his sight. They're going into the barracks. And the garrison commander was decisive. And he made the decision under pressure and immediate, to immediately remove Paul. In other words, under this pressure, what am I going to do, man? This crowd's about to kill this guy. We need to get to the bottom of the truth. What are we going to do? But functioning under functioning under pressure, he was objective. He he made a he made a, dis, a decision. It was decisive. Get in the barracks. Get in the barracks. We'll find out what's going on there. So he removed Paul from that large crowd, stating that he Paul. Actually, this is this is Paul now stating that Paul should be examined by scourging. Now, we realize that we just mentioned this. Is this the right thing to do? No. Well, why is he going to examine him? Why is he going to examine him by scourging? Why is he going to use scourging? Because he thinks he's a liar. Because he thinks he's, he's going to lie. He's not a Roman citizen. So he's going to lie. So the Roman commander's decision to remove Paul was good. Get him out of here so we can talk about this. But the procedure, which was scourging, was wrong because investigating a man by scourging is to assume that what? Paul is not a Roman. Not a Roman citizen. Yes, Paul looks like a Jew. He speaks like a Jew. And the commander makes a decision that he assumed to be correct. Due, uh, he, he made a decision that he, the commander, assumed to be correct due to the fact that Paul appears to be a Jew. So if he's a Jew... He's going to lie to us. We're not going to believe him. So we just beat him. But since Paul spoke Aramaic, the Roman commander assumed correctly that Paul was a Jew. And Paul is a Jew. But what the commander did not assume and what he did not know, therefore, this part of his decision was erroneous. He didn't realize that Paul was a Roman citizen. Then the phrase that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him that way. Let's take a look at a contrast here. We want to see the contrast between the mob and the Roman commander. Now remember, the, the, the mob is unruly. They're shouting, they're violent. But the Roman commander has some other characteristics that don't are not like the, like the mob. Now notice what it said. Look at that sentence. Look at that bullet point. See the what? What's the next word? See the what? The contrast. I remember many, many years ago, I think I've told this story a few times over all these years. It is, and we're going back all the way to 1962. We were, in a, we were in an English class, and I was required, Kent State, and I was required to write a paragraph contrasting something. So, okay. The class wrote the, they wrote the paper. I turned in a blank paper. Got an F. You know why? I didn't know what the word contrast meant. Really. So oftentimes people use the word compare and contrast. They use it as though it's synonymous. Tell me, help me. If you compare two things, what are you doing? You could look at how they are alike. That's right, how they're alike. Mm -hmm. If you contrast two things, what are you doing? How you're looking at how they're different okay so what we're going to do is we're not going to we're not going to compare the mob and the, and the roman commander we're going to show the contrast between the roman the roman uh, commander and the crowd here they are the crowd didn't want the facts they just want to they just want to kill him okay the only thing the mob wants to know is does paul conform to our religion see paul's paul's a christian now does he conform to our religion? Well, no, he doesn't. Or does he not conform to our religion? That's what they wanted to know. But the Roman commander, a man of law and order, wanted to know the facts about why the mob had been formed. He has, he has, uh, I, I, you know, I, I take that word no out of there. I, I take that word no out of there. I didn't mean to put that in there. He has respect for the mob. He understands. He, see, he, he's, I want to get to the bottom of this thing. See, he has respect for the mob in that sense. He's investigating. I'll, I'll get to the bottom of this, and if you're right out there, we'll, we'll take care of that. So he's going to investigate. 
And an investigator does what? An investigator seeks facts. The mob doesn't want facts. They just want to fall out of there. So the commander does ha, does have a right. He does have a right to ask why the mob was formed, and to to ask why the mob was formed was very impersonal. In other words, to ask to ask that question, why why was this mob formed out here? It's it's impersonal. He's not castigating anybody. He just wants to know what the truth is. So move on for a minute. In ten, verse twenty two, uh, verse twenty five. But when they when they stretched him out with thongs, see they're getting ready they're getting ready to scourge him. So when they stretched him out with with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, "Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman?" And uncondemned. Are you are you able to follow this this whole scenario here to see the, the subtleties as you move through this? So here they are. They're, 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 they've reached the point where they're stretching him. They're getting ready to beat him. Okay. And Paul says to the centurion, uh, "Excuse me, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned?" You realize that Paul's a Roman citizen realized that what they were about to do was wrong. They're going to break their own law. And these people are, are people of law and order. So Paul is actually informing the Roman centurion that he, Paul, is a Roman citizen. And it's not lawful to examine a Roman citizen by scourging. You, you see that? He's a Jew, but he's a Roman citizen. And that, that military commander didn't know this. Because he spoke Aramaic, he looked like a Jew, sounded like a Jew. He must be a Jew. He's going to lie to us. So it's not lawful to examine a Roman citizen by scourging. But if Paul is a Roman citizen, and he is, the Roman commander could be punished if Paul is scourged without due process. And amazing. So my title for verse 26 is, uh-oh, uh-oh, the Roman commander is going to be informed. So when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, uh, what are you about to do? Why? For this man's a Roman. He's a Roman citizen. So back to the verse again. When the, when the centurion heard this, what did he hear? He heard Paul tell him, I am a Roman citizen. So what did he do? The Roman centurion then went to the Roman commander, who is a man of law and order, and the Roman centurion told him, excuse me, sir. Excuse me. You see, we got him strung up in there. Do you know what you're about to do? What do you mean, what I'm about to do? Yeah, I know what I'm about to do. The guy's a liar, and we're going to scourge him. We're going to get the truth. He said, excuse me, commander. Excuse me. He tells me he's a Roman citizen. So the Roman commander was about to make a what? Big a mistake. big mistake. Why? No two things about the Roman centurion. He respects the commander. He is loyal to his commander. Let me point out something here. If you, if you have, Steve, if you're working for somebody you don't like, so you're you're a superior, okay? Now I know you're a man of God. I know that you. I know that you're. You walk in the spirit of the spirit, but just set that aside for a moment. Picture yourself operating in the spirit of the flesh. You have a supervisor you just don't like. This guy just a mess. He's just banging on you all the time, making it hard for you. And you realize that. All of a sudden, a circumstance pops up where this guy is about to make one heck of a big mistake. You know he's going to make a mistake. You think, this is my ch That's right. Steve just went this way. Says, you're going, to, you're going to zip your mouth, and you're going to watch it, and you're going to sit back and say, ha, 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 he finally got his. <laughs> but see, that's the kind of a situation this is here. This centurion is looking at his higher up, his superior. He sees this guy, he's, he's going to make one heck of a bad mistake. 
And the thing of it is, it's going to affect the guy that makes the mistake, not the guy, not the centurion. It's going to affect the guy that's making the mistake. Amen. So what happened? The centurion then goes to his goes to the commander, and he shows his respect for his commander, and shows that he is loyal to him. Because if the centurion follows through with the scourging, guess what? He's okay. He's simply following orders. However, the commander issued the order. He is jeopardizing his career as a military person. Why? Because he is breaking the law. He is scourging a Roman citizen because he made a mistake by assuming that Paul was a Jew. Okay? It is. He's Roman. He's Roman. Move on for just a minute. Verse 27. The, the commander, that's the, the Roman commander, the Roman commander came and said to Paul, tell me. Really, we're going to change, change the tape here, folks. Hang on just a second. Okay, so the Roman commander came to Paul and said to him, tell me. I'm the Roman commander. Please tell me. Are you really, are you really a Roman citizen? And what Paul said, yes. Yes, I am. Well, verse 28, the commander makes an interesting observation. So he goes to him, he gets, finds out Paul's Roman, Roman, uh, Roman citizen. So the Roman commander answered and said, I, now watch this. He said, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. Now here's what happened. The Ro this Roman this Roman commander, he is a commander in the Roman army, Roman military, and he said, I am here enforcing Roman law and order. You tell me, Paul, you tell me you're a Roman citizen. I'm about to scourge you. He said, I am a Roman citizen. But he said, I purchased my citizenship. So now looking at Paul and seeing that he's a Jew, if he tells him, if Paul tells him, I am a Roman, I'm a Jew, but I'm a Roman citizen. And the Roman commander said, I purchased my citizenship. What do you think about Paul? What do you think about Paul? How did Paul get his citizenship? No, that, that's how he got it. Oh yeah. But what? What? See, the, the commander didn't know that. Oh. So how does how does what's the what does the Roman commander think about Paul? What's that now? See, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So he's assuming now that Paul bought his citizenship. So we learn that the Roman commander. Now we learn here though that um, let, let me let me back up here. The the, the commander answered. I acquired this Roman citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, oh, no, that's what happened to you. But I was actually born a Roman citizen. What we learn here is that the Roman commander was a foreigner serving in the Roman military. Please get that? He is a foreigner that is serving in the Roman military. And under Roman law, a foreigner could purchase the rights of freedom and could purchase Roman citizenship. So a foreigner could do that. Indirectly, here's what happened. The Roman commander was inquiring of Paul how much money he had paid to become a Roman citizen. You see that? However, Paul was actually descended from an old and distinguished Roman family. In verse, uh, moving on there, Paul says, uh, no, the, the commander, the commander said, I acquired this citizenship of a large sum of money. This Roman commander was actually of some other nationality. He was not a Roman citizen, but enlisted in the Roman army. Now listen, he was not a Roman citizen, but enlisted in the Roman army. He was not a citizen when he enlisted. That's the idea. He was from some other nation. But he enlisted in the Roman army as a, as a foreigner, 
the Romans took a certain number of people who were non-citizens, and if a, if a portion of their pay could be taken every month and put into the treasury, they were given credit for it. And when they reached a certain sum, they could purchase citizenship. And that's exactly what this guy did. But Paul didn't pay anything for his citizenship. Paul said, I was what? I was born a Roman citizen. Now the phrase here, when the, when the Roman commander says, I acquired, that word, that word acquired is kataomai, and it means to purchase. I acquired, I purchased. So the, the Roman commander had followed a procedure. What is it? You enlist in a Roman army. You allow them to take so much money out of your pay over an extended period of time, and when you've reached a certain, a certain, uh, a certain amount of credit, you have the option then of becoming a Roman citizen. And that's what he did. He purchased it. So the Roman commander had followed a procedure. He purchased his citizenship by a regular procedure. In verse, uh, moving on to the next word. The next word is citizenship. I purchased my citizenship. The word citizenship is the word politian. And this word indicates the rights. I became a Roman citizen. I have rights. I have the freedom that belongs to Romans. That word citizenship implies that. It comes from politian. And this word indicates the rights of being a Roman citizen, the freedom to enter into the affairs of the state. It's the word from which we get our word, what? Politics. Politics. Politian. But he actually says here, but, I, but Paul says, but I, I, I hear you, but I didn't buy anything. I was actually born a Roman citizen. Now, here's something interesting. The grammatical construction of this phrase indicates the following. The grammatical construction of the verse, that means the Greek, indicates this. Paul is not a first-generation citizen. Roman citizen, that is, okay? Paul's grandfather was a Roman citizen. But at the moment of Paul's birth, he received Roman citizenship. Paul was the son of a Roman citizen. And at the moment of, Paul, the moment of birth, physical birth, that is, Paul was recognized as a Roman citizen. The other guy bought his citizenship. Paul says, no, I didn't buy it. I was born a Roman citizen. Now, we find here in verse 29 that the commander fears. That he, what's happened now? The guy's just found out, wait a minute, I'm about to, about to beat a guy to get the truth out of him. And he's a Roman. I can't do this. So the commander fears, and Paul is released. Verse 29. Therefore, those who were about to examine Paul immediately let go. They let go of Paul. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. Commander had ordered this. Chain him up. Chain him up and beat him. We're going to get the truth. So therefore, those who are about to chain Paul immediately let him go. What did they do? They, were, they now are respecting Paul because he is a Roman. And the Roman commander was afraid. Why? He was about to break the law. Well, it's a good thing that, good thing that that centurion respected him and was loyal to him. This guy's in deep trouble. So the Roman commander was also afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because the Roman commander had put him in chains, he had commanded him to do that, commanded them to do that. So rough treatment as a Roman citizen breaks stringent Roman law, strict, strict Roman law. They are people of law and order. The Roman commander would be in trouble from just ordering Paul to be chained. See, yeah, I got to thinking about that. He didn't follow through. But I'll tell you what, depending on who that guy's supervisor is, just the very fact that you didn't think before you did, didn't investigate properly, you are still in trouble for even considering going in that direction. You know better than that. Therefore, those who are about to examine him, let immediately let him go. Two things here. Because of Paul's citizenship, they respectfully withdrew. There would be no examination by scourging. Okay? 
Now, verse, uh, the last phrase. And the commander was also afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. So the Roman commander had exceeded his authority. Rough treatment of Roman citizens was never tolerated. And I think we ought to emphasize it. It was never tolerated. He recognized that his decision to scourge Paul was a big mistake. And now the Roman commander testifies. No, no not testifies, rectifies. And now the Roman commander rectifies that bad decision. In other words, he's going to change the direction he's going to go. In verse 30, Paul is now under Roman protection. Why? He's under the Roman commander. He realized that Paul is a Roman. The, the religious, unbelieving Jews were out there trying to kill him. He's inside. He's changed his mind. We can't do this. But on the next day, the Roman commander, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set them before them. Let's look and see what all that means. So after he lets him loose, you've got a short period of time in there, and he's hit four, four days. He wipes his brow, you know, wipes his brow and says, wow, man, that was close. I just about made a big mistake. My, my military career is going to be ruined because of that. But, boy, John over here, Centur John Centurion, whoever you are, whatever you are, Mr. Centurion, I sure am glad you came to me. Good gracious. You saved my life. On the next day, the Roman commander, wishing to know for certain, and his wishing to know for certain, what that means is he's going to be objective, and he's free from emotion. This is objectivity free from emotion. So he wanted to know for certain why, seeking factual evidence, Paul had been accused by these religious, unbelieving zealots out there. He, the, he, the Roman commander, then released Paul, and the Roman commander ordered the chief priests and the council, this is the religious group now, and brought Paul down and set him before them, that is, set them before the chief priests and the council. I'm going to set them before these religious people now. Four quick bullet points. The Roman commander is now going to do the next thing that is required of him as a, as a garrison commander. He's got, he's, uh, he's got control of all of his faculties now. He understands what's going on. So he's going to take the next step. He will call the, party, call the parties together and make an investigation. So what we have here is the religious crowd, the head of the religious crowd that's opposing Paul, and going to bring Paul in. Going to get, him, get him together now and get to the bottom of this. He's going to assemble the chief priests and all of the council, which is the Sanhedrin, and he will place Paul under Roman protection, which actually means at this point in time, Paul will be protected until we get to the bottom of this. Now, that's the end, that's the end of chapter, uh, chapter 22. I wasn't sure how long it would take. We're about three minutes short of the hour. I uh, would have had another 17 minutes, but we're going to stop right here and, and move on and come back on Sunday morning, pick up in Chapter 23, and move on from here. Okay? So let's do this. Uh, Steve? Have, have yeah, yeah, go ahead. Didn't, uh, didn't the uh, religious uh, Jews uh, consider uh, dogs as a very low thing? They considered Gentiles dogs. Yes. And that's why they hated them, didn't want to. Them to have that's that's they they yeah. they titled them that yes they yeah. called them that yes they did mm -hmm. well, yeah. there was scum the scum of the earth you know yeah, yeah. okay go ahead and uh, go ahead and pray for us Steve and we'll close this out Father we thank you for the study and the great bold example that uh, Paul yes. did in going right up to the last second to, to be uh, go through this test and Father each day we are are tested to. Uh, Live the right. life that we live, Father. We pray for the same kind of boldness that he had to uh, stand for what you want us to and to, to yes. follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in the times ahead. For they are trying testing times. And we just thank you for this great lesson. Thank you for Dr. Jim's passion for teaching it to us. And thank you for this lesson. Bless us in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, Steve, that's right. You know, we, we, see, we see the importance of our lives as born again Christians. To follow the leadership of the Spirit in the light of truth and be courageous to be able to do it. I think it's a good lesson.
Okay, so listen, let me just, uh, don't anybody go away just yet. Uh, uh, Barbara Harrison's on with us from Houston, Texas. Good evening, Miss Barbara. God bless you. Uh, Bob, and, uh, Bob and Wilma are on from, uh, uh, from uh, Fayetteville. And uh, this is Leanne Bertell, my daughter here at the house, my son Brian Bertell here in town, about a half a mile from here. Uh, Danny and uh, Carolyn Plummer are from Greenbrier, Arkansas. Dennis and Don Paul are from Bigelow, Arkansas. Doug Haynes, God bless you, Doug. This is the this is the son of Miss Donna Haynes, and Doug is on with us tonight. And thank you so much for being with us tonight, Doug. Our, our beloved Cat Kennedy uh, is um, uh, online with us again tonight. Uh, Miss Cat is living in Texas, and remember her uh, her husband has recently passed away. A wonderful, wonderful Bible believer. Uh, a leader, just just soaking up Bible truth. Miss mm-hmm. uh, Cat has been without her husband now for a couple of weeks. Uh, keep her in mind. Is uh, but she's strong. Good gracious, she is strong and a lover to death. Okay, uh, Miss Kim Williams is online with us tonight. Thank you, Kim. We really appreciate you from Little Rock. Ollie Hatfield is uh, no Had it's Hadfield. Ollie Hadfield is on with us tonight. This is a friend of Cat's. And uh, Miss Ollie has been with us now for several weeks, and we really appreciate her logging on. And Richard and Nita Clark are here uh, in town in Little Rock online with us also. Uh, I want to thank, uh, I, oh, I see, uh, I, must, I guess I jumped over Dan, Danny, and, or Daryl rather. I saw Danny and Carolyn and looked down. Uh, Daryl, Daryl Anderson, uh, Sir Daryl, and uh, Miss Nita Anderson, and uh, uh, Miss April Bienney is online with us also. And I want to thank April for being with us tonight. Uh, God bless all of you and all of our friends in the Philippines. We love you and uh, love you to death, okay? So thanks for being online. I'm going to go ahead and lo- uh, shut down the recording on um, WebEx. I'm also going to stop the recording on...